I, I'm very excited to be talking about Narnia today. Um, this is um, a series that I grew up with. I want to say I was... I'm going to look up when the movie came out. Uh, I think it was in second or third grade. Um, whenever uh, the first movie came out. Uh, and then we went to go see it like as a school. Uh, which I... <laughs> We used to do that a lot. Uh, I, I was homeschooled from middle school and, and high school, but in elementary school, we used to just go see movies uh, as a field trip. So it's like one year we saw Polar Express, and those are Christmas movies. Uh, saw Polar Express well, one year, uh, 2005. So I was in third grade. Uh, we went to go see Chronicles of Narnia. And one of the coolest things, and it's one of my favorite memories, is um, what we would do as a as like a class. And then, you know, it's a basic class, about 25, 30 kids, um, is every day we would, in leading up to going to see the movie, we would, as a class, read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, like chapter by chapter uh, i don't remember how many chapters a day it may have been one chapter a day it may have been two but i just remember that it was it was so cool it, it it's kind of like um it's almost like those videos that you see of like those um those bar watch parties of uh uh game of thrones uh with like everyone's reactions but it was like that in a in a school um reading lion the witch in the wardrobe which was a lot of fun um and that kind of always you know inspired me to um uh start writing a kids book myself because i want to write something that uh a, a, a class of third graders can read together and you know have these reactions together so uh that's kind of my my history with the uh, with the series um all right, so let's see. Uh, Daniel, can you hear us? Uh, we are still having technical issues. Um, oh, wait, it says mute. Let's see. Edit mic settings. Hmm. So it sounds like Daniel can maybe hear us, but he's having trouble speaking. Um, sometimes, Daniel, I have to unplug my headphones to plug them back in we apologize for these technical difficulties um let's see all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna pull him back out of okay yeah the thing while we figure this out um okay <laughs> uh as for me um narnia was always kind of this thing that i saw i was like oh it's that boring british thing again where some <laughs> kids are talking to a lion and they're in a closet i don't know what's going on there's snow everywhere <laughs> that is such a weird way to put it it's a bunch of kids <laughs> in the closet you know <laughs> it's a bunch of kids they're in a closet now they're in snow and there's a lion i don't know what's going on <laughs> You know, it was just one of those things I did not grow up uh, knowing anything about. Like, did I mean, did you know the relationship between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien? Well, see, I, I didn't grow up with Lord of the Rings either. I just, for whatever okay. reason, my family just did not. <laughs> that was just not something I knew. You know, I knew about, just to get on um, track here with Lord of the Rings. Let me see if I can pull Daniel in now. How about now, Daniel? Can we hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Awesome. Awesome. Hey. Very cool. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we, go. we were just talking about um, our experiences with Narnia. Uh, Caleb's talking okay. about how he grew up with the series. And okay. so now I'm talking about mine. And I knew nothing really about Narnia other than that was that weird British thing with the kids going into a closet. <laughs> and then there's a stone and there's a lion. <laughs> That's so funny. That's, that's a that's a humorous way of uh, putting it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, so he was asking me about uh, 
Tolkien. Well, I, I didn't really grow up with Tolkien either. <clears throat> I knew there was a uh, Hobbit cartoon, and that's pretty much all I knew until the Lord of the Rings movies came out. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the uh, the Ralph Bashke, uh production. Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah. Of the, of the story, yeah, and he also did Lord of the Rings as well uh, in, yeah. a, in a two part <laughs> series. Yeah, yeah, I, I I'm familiar with that too. Um. So then, I guess over the years, I kind of knew a little bit more about, oh, Lion, Witch, Wardrobe, Lion's supposed to be Jesus, and he dies and comes back, and that's that's kind of all I knew about it. Um, so a few right. weeks ago when I started actually reading it, so. Okay. Um, Which, how did that come up? I can't remember. Um, so I've just been on a kick for the last couple of years of, I need to read some of these things. I need to read Lord of the Rings. I need to read Dune. I need to, you know, I just need to learn different things. Uh, read Nevering Story. That was a little bit while back, but um, you know, just want to learn different stuff. Okay. So, so how about you, Daniel? What's your experience with, uh, with Narnia? So, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember back. The first book that I read was Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. I want to say I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, maybe 12 when I read the book and shortly after got copies of the other books, the other six uh, for the series and tried to go through in order of the numbers, not in order of how they came out, which is actually something I learned later <laughs> that there was a release order. Yeah. Yeah. That there was a, the way they were released is not the way they yeah, were. Yeah. I actually, I actually tried to read these about, I would say like 10 years ago or five years ago. Someone said, Oh, you got to read Narnia. And I started reading magic, the magician's nephew and I could not get into it. And so I stopped and then, sure. yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, you're not supposed to start with that one. Even though it says number one. Yeah. I believe <laughs> so. you found that out just a couple weeks ago. Whenever me and Orc were, were talking about it, you're like, wait, yeah. that's not how they were released. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you guys, you know, uh, he he mentions uh, that he saw the BBC series when he was a kid. I've actually never seen that. Are, are you all familiar with the, the BBC series? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I've never seen I, them. I, I don't recall when I was exposed to them because it just, it feels like one of those like childhood memories back in the ether. I don't <laughs> recall when this right. happened, but I do remember very clearly watching all those through and actually kind of, just kind of as a, I don't know, a, a miniature trauma being frustrated that when Disney or whoever it was came out with the new ones, they didn't go all the way to silver chair. That was a real, cause I was yeah. like BBC at least did that, you know, like as, yeah. as, as subpar maybe as the production was, they at least had the ability to go, okay, we need to produce at least four of these and yeah. complete the saga with, you know, like the, the connection there at the end between the Pevensies and, uh, Hustis and Jill Pohl and mm -hmm. like that last part where which kind of like bookends like the explicitly the, the Pevensey side of things they obviously show up in, in later on spoiler alert are, are we doing spoilers I'm sorry oh, yeah yeah okay. um okay we can we can I didn't want to yeah, I'm I'm okay if we spoil <laughs> something out of the okay. later books I've read okay. through oh, Silver that's, Chair that's right okay. yeah I, I forgot okay. it's whenever <clears throat> that's, yeah that's I've, true. i have it's... read through silver chair i'm very curious what happens in last battle i just have not got there yet okay um i know a lot of characters come back or at least are mentioned in last battle yeah but mm -hmm. i yeah. um it's yeah. it's your avengers end game so yeah I, yeah man. <laughs> I, I would prefer not to hear like did you want more <laughs> yeah i would prefer not to have it like explicitly spoil but if something comes up something comes gotcha. up yeah if you cool. slip that's yeah. fine yeah. um okay Crawford. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't but yeah happen. i yeah, yeah so i i know everything through silver chair I, I'll okay say that. cool um so yeah um so i guess uh we'll talk a little bit about the reading order the the uh publisher suggests you read these in chronological order as the events happen so magician's nephew is, is number one the first book um i think we all agree that that is not the way to read these that you should yeah <laughs> read them in the order it came out at least your first so, time through. yes yeah. um yeah go, go ahead yeah so i not just that it, it, it's almost like and it, it's not this bad but it is similar it's like if you were to start with phantom menace in star wars yeah. Um, with like 
because <sighs> magician's nephew isn't even like a strong start anyways it's it's it, out of the series it's not one of my favorites um so um yeah definitely not a not a strong start um i will always you know push <laughs> Lion, the witch in the wardrobe because Lion, the witch in the wardrobe <laughs> is actually my favorite of all of them anyway so um yeah absolutely that is that is not the way uh and i think it's so funny that that that's how you started and also why you stopped reading them. <laughs> Yeah, I just I, I was like I don't know what's going on. I you know I just could not get into it. So um, so yeah. Um, the the other thing we were talking about the BBC series. Yeah, you know, I would just see it while flipping channels. Like they would show it on PBS. You know, how PBS would show like uh, yeah yeah different mm -hmm. BBC programs, and I'm always like, what? Are, I don't know what's going on with these kids and the snow and <laughs> you know. So <laughs> um, so let's talk about the the first book here. Uh, lion witch in the wardrobe um i guess we'll start talking about the kids um okay we got peter susan uh lucy and edmund i think i got that right yes he did um i, I kind of saw peter as like the valiant hero almost like the your leonardo of the group you know the magnificent yes yeah that's right that's um, right the magnificent <laughs> um, uh, but yeah no def definitely the uh the the leonardo the one who trying trying to do right um trying to do right by his siblings even though he may not um oh yeah definitely properly introduces everything um but um try, trying to do right by his younger siblings while also not exactly knowing how to um i, I think lucy is your child at heart that believes in fairy tales and loves everything and just very kind hearted mm -hmm. um we have uh i just said her name i already forgot susan, susan. Mm -hmm. who is very forgettable and uh i, <laughs> I, for, I she just <laughs> never seems to do anything um and then we have edmund who i think is the little stinker who <laughs> it just yeah. causes a lot of havoc in the, in the he first book. he is my favorite character in all of literature <laughs> in I all love, literature wow that's, oh, that's oh i i that's want so i i want to name my son edmund like <laughs> legit i i i love edmund so much i i like the character too but i really want to i want to hear you unpack that that's intriguing okay, favorite okay. in all literature that's yeah no that's that's interesting so please yeah, yeah go ahead uh, so the the reason I love Edmund is because of uh, in in faith, you know, he represents all of us. Mm. Um, like, and and it's one of my favorite things that like I never figured it out until I was like a, a young adult, becoming an adult. Mm. As a kid, I was always like, oh, man, you know, Ed Edmund wasn't he wasn't with the rest of the kids. So he didn't get his present from Santa. Right. He didn't get his gift. Yeah. Yeah. OK. But then I realized what his gift was. His gift was Aslan taking his place. His gift was the gift that mm -hmm. Jesus gives to us. You know, yeah. it, you know, if, yeah. if you know, if, you, if you're a believer and that's the thing is this is going to be a very. Uh, a faith-based discussion because that's really sure obviously oh yeah, of course yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't this, yeah. i don't see how Spoiler we can't alert, like, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so i i i kind of want to name my child edmund <clears throat> because it would become a discussion like yeah. i would give i would give him line the witch of the wardrobe I would give him uh like the, the the movie and you know all that and he'd be like right. dad why did you name me after the worst yeah 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 <laughs> and i mean like and, and there's and so yeah i mean Ed, edmund my my three favorite characters are, are edmund eustace and uh Ripici, which edmund eustace you'll you'll find a uh <laughs> you'll oh, find yeah. a, 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 well, a correlation there De definitely a com a um definitely a correlation between him and he, uh eustace a hundred percent i see that 
Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I'd love for you to yeah talk out um, him and Reepicheep's correlation. That's interesting as well. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So, so Reaper Cheap, I I just love Reaper Cheap. Um, okay. In, not in relation to 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 Edmund and Eustace, although I do love the relationship between Eustace and Reaper Cheap. Yeah, um, yeah, because they all they great, know each other. Yeah, that, that's a great relationship. But with Reaper Cheap, you know, he is very much the. I mean, he he is the servant. He is uh, the I strong in faith, and I mean. When when Aslan's like uh, at the end of uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, oh, it, it's not time to, to go into my land yet. And Reaper Cheap's mm. like, nope, I'm going anyways. Yep. Like, you have this. Yep. And so so that's why I love Reaper Cheap. Uh, my dad's favorite character right. is actually Reaper Cheap uh, as well. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Cool. Um, so, yeah, that, I, uh, those, those those are really my, my, my three favorite characters. But Edmund I, over the rest of them. I, I kind of see Edmund as he starts out as the skeptic. He he doesn't mm -hmm. um, he does not believe Lucy, and even when he sees evidence that Lucy may be, you know, when he's the one who sees it, he still denies it. Even though he's been to Narnia, he's still saying no, Lucy's lying. You know, and mm. I think I think that that is human nature. You know, if you're if you're a non-believer, you're like, no, they're crazy. Those Christians over there, they're crazy, and then. Even when you start seeing evidence, you you are still <laughs> denying it, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I, I've always struggled with him, like being the skeptic. Because I mean, like Susan is the skeptic. Susan's the one that's like, it's not logical. It's not. Yeah. Edmund, I've never really gotten a peg on that because, like, mm. he he's met these creatures. He, but he uh, still deny he denies it. He's like, oh well, yeah. Don't listen, to Lucy. She's crazy. Yeah, you know. I don't. I don't think he's denying it because he doesn't believe. Though I think he's just right. bullying his sister. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Which, I, which I mean, like that's that that's a whole other thing, you know. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then of course Lucy, Lu Lucy, I think is like. Uh, by the way daughter i definitely want to name lucy um lucy because lucy is um the faith like a child yeah like like that 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 is 100 percent what lucy is is uh <laughs> she she has faith like a child she uh <laughs> i don't even think see i don't even think c.s lewis likes uh susan so <laughs> <laughs> I just, I saw somebody like jump in the comment section and was like no one likes Susan. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay, okay. So so here, here's the thing. I mentioned this. Um, we as vague as possible, Daniel. Um, okay. Does C.S. Lewis do Susan dirty in the last battle? Hmm. Okay. And, and, um, and whenever we whenever he reads last battle, and we can discuss that. We can go in more. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I just want I, like I feel like I've read the spoiler before about Susan <laughs> that she kind of denies everything at the end, or you know she's not. We'll, I don't know. We'll we'll wait for you to read it. I, okay, I do, okay. I, I want you to read it. I think experientially that would be good for the conversation. What I will okay. say here and now is, I don't think he does. I actually think there's a deeper, there's a channel I'm trying to think of. Uh, a guy who covered this has a series called Through the Wardrobe. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I'm not, but I will look at okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's like, it's really well done. The channel, he's got like um, artist rendering pictures in the background and he does commentary on the books. And he actually has done a really good job, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about external literature that kind of talks about the timeline and how everything sort of falls between the, the Narnia world and our world. Really, really good in-depth stuff, I think, and, and entertaining. Is but it into makes, the wardrobe? Into the wardrobe? I think that's it. I think okay. that's the channel. And so he, he addresses that question. He goes into the whole thing about Susan and he talks about the issues and last battle, but he makes a nod to the introductory part of Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe where Lewis actually I'm forgetting who it is he assigns this to. It's like a, a niece, I think, or a nephew. I think it was a goddaughter I was reading. A goddaughter, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. In, the, in the opening pages and talks about, you know, those who are too old for fairy tales, but one day you'll be old enough for them again. 
Yes, yes, that, that is a quote. Uh, one yeah. day you'll be old enough to to read yes. fairy tales again. Yes. I love that quote. And I think, I think that the guy who does this channel into the wardrobe is right. I think Susan's story and how it ends is a nod to that real person. Okay. I think oh. there's a. So I'd like I'd like us when we get when you when Aaron gets through reading, I'd like us to go back and reevaluate that because I think I think that's the key to that whole mm-hmm. question. About okay. Susan. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I I just want to mention that because I've never gotten um, I've never I don't know anyone who has mm-hmm. actually read past Voyage of the the Dawn Treader because that's the, the last, <laughs> because that's the last movie. Right. Um, yeah. So I I needed perspective from somebody who has also read the last battle because yeah. I've been dying to ask someone that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Hundred percent. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a great question, and I think a lot of Narnia fans, whether you're familiar with all the books or not, or even the conversation about the different characters from a faith perspective, everybody has that question. Because the 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 way again, trying not to give anything away, but the way the last battle ends in regard to the Pevensey kids is a shock. It's it's yes. a it's something we're not expecting. So mm-hmm. from a literary perspective, that's a good thing because it like captivates. It's like oh wow, what's going on there? But from a from the perspective of being a fan and kind of wanting a more of a neat, nice bow, it, it's it is a, it's a shocker. It jars you. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. The, I, I, there there comes a point where you realize, oh, okay, the Pevensies are just um, it, it, it it's more about the Caspian bloodline than the Pevensies at a point. Right. Um. So. I think we'll move on to the the witch and the lion discussion here. Um, I was listening to these while I was working. So there's some of these details I may have gotten wrong or I misheard because I was (laughs) busy doing other stuff while trying to listen to these. Um, So the witch, I I believe, represents the devil, if I'm, I would assume. Although I haven't read the last battle, so (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. And and again, here, (laughs) once again, um, once I think you, there are, there are multiple devils in. in yeah, this yes, series. yes, right, and and that's once you learn, once you read the last battle, it'll be easier to kind of address that from okay. like a, an overview perspective. Absolutely, as an initial introduction, in terms of like an antagonist protagonist, one hundred percent a devil figure, uh, a yeah. enemy character, right? But as you go deeper. further, yeah, as you go further in the books, you'll see that. Just like Hale said, there are other devils. Yeah, because it's silver Even, chair, the lady turned into a snake and all that. Right, so, right. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you have you have the, and, and I know we're not going to talk about this book today, but like, obviously, silver chair, you have the woman, the lady, the green lady. But then you also have in like Horse and His Boy, you've got Rabidash and you have, yeah. you've got other figures. There's a whole like, you know, you've got the, the empire uh, like south of Narnia. And all of that that's going on, yeah. and there's a deity that they worship. There's, there's a whole another part of the yeah. world. Which okay, is, so yeah, maybe think really more as demons and devils mm-hmm. than the yeah. devils. Right. Okay, right. Re- yeah. Really, a, a horse and his boy. It, it, it's not exactly, but it's almost like, like it's the closest that Narnia will get to the origin of evil. Mm-hmm. Um, Agree. So that that that's really that, and and that's what that's what I think is really interesting is. Um, as far as the layout of the series, you've got these first four, which you know we're only talking about three, but you've got the first four, which is about the kids, um, mm-hmm. and the kind of like learning the what Narnia is, who lives there, the Caspian bloodline, mm-hmm. and then you've got this two book interlude. One is about the origin of evil, and one is about essentially the origin of good, because uh, mm-hmm. Magician's nephew is about the origin of Narnia, origin of Aslan, all that. Yeah. Um, and then um, the last battle kind of like brings it all together. Mm. So um, I, I think they're very, very interesting in the in the way that's all laid out. Um, almost mm. kind of reminds me of uh, Stephen King's uh, Dark Tower series. Mm. These are better though, but <laughs> sure, yeah, of course. I, um, I yeah, but... so the. We see the witch use temptation on Edmund with the was a Turkish delight, I think, that she can't give it him. That's right. Um, have you guys ever had Turkish delight? I have not. No, but funny enough, I took a trip. I was I was traveling overseas and we and we we stopped in Turkey in Istanbul and mm-hmm. we were walking through the airport and there was a giant 
like on the side in the store, like all this Turkish delight, like stacked up boxes <laughs> of it, like a pyramid. And I was walking by, like, yeah. oh, there's the Turkish delight. <laughs> 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 I was looking for. And it that, that was a wild yeah. experience. So yeah. yeah. So um I, I have had it. Um okay. there are actually different kinds. If it was it, it's one of those things where like if it's just the regular Turkish delight, it's like Edmund, come on, this tastes this is, this tastes like flowers or something. <laughs> but they have like they have like strawberry ones too, which are really good. Um okay. but yeah, like like just traditional Tur- Turkish delight is like rose water, okay. which is a, which is a very um acquired taste okay gotcha <laughs> um but but yeah uh uh there there's definitely the the temptation with the, the Turkish delight and the uh the the, the hot chocolate um mm-hmm. which uh the the scene in the movie which uh my uncle you have not seen the movie yet um but like once once he's done with it she just throws it against the tree and it like dissipates into snow. It's such a cool shot. It's yeah. So cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, we almost watched Chronicles of Narnia last night and we went with Candy Cane Lane instead. We were, <laughs> we were kind of like, we don't want to get into a movie we have to really pay attention to last night. So uh, I'm sure sometime during December we will watch uh, mm-hmm. Chronicles of Narnia. So. 100%. It's, it's definitely, I, I would argue, tooth and nail, it's a Christmas film. Oh yes, absolutely. It's it's a hundred percent of Christmas. And, Santa and, appears, of course. Yeah, Father <laughs> Christmas. So I I think it, it's definitely that, and also the way in which it's. Uh, I mean, I think those movies stand up today against yes, absolutely everything else. Yeah, it's just I think they're so well done. But definitely, yeah, you you see that sort of theme emerging in the story. Maybe not as a primary thing, but it's part of Lewis's expression of. Uh, the idea of cheer and Thanksgiving juxtaposed to the wickedness of the witch where, you know, she keeps her, Tumna says, you know, Narnia has been under her thumb for a hundred years, always winter, never Christmas. And just sort of this idea of like the worst parts, I guess you could say of existence just exacerbated. And then the best parts or the things that are enjoyable and bring happiness totally snuffed out. And then Aslan shows up, that all starts to just like spring after wintertime all that starts to come back to life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a reflection of the world now where you just see mm-hmm. insanity online and streaming and yeah, chaos yeah. in the world. But Christmas time, <laughs> we're still singing about baby Jesus stuff. It's still right. It's still getting mm-hmm. out there, even with all the noise that we're surrounded with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, fun, yeah. Fact, what, fun fact, they're actually uh, in the movie. Lion K uh, has a, uh, I think it's called In Like a Lion. Uh, it it's always winter, never Christmas, which is a which is a great song. <laughs> yeah, that's a, very cool. Yeah. Um, um, so I guess we'll move on to to Aslan. Um, if I'm saying that right, um, Aslan. Yeah. Yeah. I I really like when characters encounter him for the first time. Oh, how brilliant. how some people how they react differently to him. Like Edmund has a very different reaction to him than the other children mm. do. Uh, and I almost feel like that that's how believers or non-believers, if they you know have a a God moment, how they react also. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the the other three kids. You know they they they've heard of Aslan. They. And you know they've been they've they've been searching for him, and then he's kind of got like this 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 majesty. And then whenever Edmund meets him, it's more like a like a uh, a sh- uh, he's almost got shame, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's which which then of course follows. Um, uh, followed by one of my favorite lines in the whole book. Mm. What's done is done. There is no need to speak with Edmund about his past. Mm. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I mean, like that's, I mean, that, 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 that's what, but what, what God says uh, in a way is mm. um, uh, what one way that, that I was always uh, taught was, you know, 
what, once you're forgiven, um, you could bring it up to God again and then be like, what are you even talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, cause like, you know, what's done is done. Right. So we don't need to talk about this anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, that, that, that whole point where after they've saved Edmund, Edmund and Aslan are talking, um, I just, I just love that because mm -hmm. you can see the, the sorrow on Edmund's face, but also just the joy of whenever he sees that he's accepted by his family again. Mm. Yeah. I love this uh, character. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I do. I, I love that scene and I love how Edmund to me, and we're probably, I'm probably jumping ahead here a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to take that. Uh, go ahead. We're going to go down there. So the, the four Pevensey kids, a lot of Lewis's writings, at least to me, seem very heavily influenced by his tradition. So he was an Anglican. And so there's like, there's some very strong Catholic traditions, not, not, ex it's not exclusively Catholic, but there's a lot of that in there. And so like, when you're looking at the four Pevensey kids, there's a, there's a nod to the four gospels. There's a nod to the first four disciples that Jesus called, right? Sim uh, Simon, Peter, James, and John. And then you also have sort of a nod to, in, in specifically Edmund's case, a nod to Judas. And mm -hmm. he's actually called the betrayer in the story. What's intriguing, though, is that in Narnia, in, in Lewis's narrative, you have a redemption of the Judas. Yes. You have mm -hmm. the Lord redeeming Judas. And so it's, so it's, and what's cool about that is if you're, if you're sort of thinking in those terms, is that the kids come up, right? So Aslan's talking with Edmund. Uh, I, I forget if it's the fairies or if it's the, the satyrs, whoever, that tell the kids, hey, we found your brother. And so they run to see where Edmund is, and he's talking with Aslan. And then, just like you said, he comes down and tells them, you know, it's over. There's no need to talk about what's past. And the kids, who understandably, experientially, like, have sort of a, I think probably more Peter than anybody, but they're, like, frustrated with Edmund that he, like, that he went with the witch, that he, you know, that he betrayed them. But they take Aslan's lead, and they forgive him by being instructed by the Lord to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, there's a whole bunch going on to me in that scene that I love so much. The way that the church is supposed to treat people who have been forgiven in spite of what they've done, because God's already dealt with it. And he expects mm -hmm. us to be in line with what he wants, which is forgiveness and grace. Oh, because yeah. He's given. So there's, yeah, I just, I, I love, I love Edmund's story and I love that scene. And I love how it plays into, uh, for us, how we see theology in light of God's heart toward those who have wandered that he wants to bring back and restore and redeem. So I, uh, I saw a news report it's been a couple of years ago where um, I won't go into details, but basically the pastor <clears throat> pastor got up in front of the church and confessed all these horrible sins he had done. <clears throat> and the church forgave him right then and there. And the news media did not understand why they are standing with this man who just said, I did all this bad stuff. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that is, I mean, well, that's, that's us. That's the Christians. We're supposed to lift each other up and forgive each other. Right. And, and, uh, you know, so, um, I think one part that I really like though, is, you know, the Pevensies do follow Aslan's lead on that. Yeah. Lucy doesn't have to be told. Right. Yeah. 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 She, she, I mean, she is just, right. she has to be stopped Yeah. Uh, before, before she, because, you know, Edmund and, and Aslan are still talking and yeah. she's so excited to go see him, but they're like, no, no, wait, just wait until they finish talking, Lucy. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's the good. the other thing with, with Aslan is how people approach him. They are scared of Aslan. <laughs> and yeah. you know, it's because it's a lion. And uh right. yeah. I, I think that, you know, we are <clears throat> as as Christians, when we talk to God, he is a powerful being we should have res that respect and fear of him and i mm. think the world tries to diminish him constantly and uh yeah, yeah so um okay so the the witch and i may get some of this mixed up here is trying to prevent the prophecy that the two sons of adam and the two uh, daughters of eve will destroy her and become the um the rulers the of Narnia. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so she charges Edmund with treason, if I recall. Um, <clears throat> so, well, it, it, ironically, it's it's the crime that he commits in trying to be in service to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like she, so he betrays Aslan. He betrays the true, the righteous king, the right, the rightful ruler and, and king of Narnia, and in so doing, becomes guilty of sin, which, again, is supposed to be in the service of the White Witch. But she then turns on him advantageously for her benefit and goes to Aslan and says, well, you have a betrayer here. Never mind the fact he was trying to help me, but you have a betrayer and all betrayers and, and, you know, sinners are, are mine, my property. And that's an, that's an interesting conversation between the witch and the lion where there's some, there's some allusions back to some of the other books uh, specifically, again, try not to give spoilers here, but, uh, I mean, he, he he straight up says, "Do not repeat back to me. I was there when it was written." Right, right, yeah. And so that's that's yeah. the reference to the magician's nephew. Is that the the origin of Narnia itself? Is that there's this this call back to creation and this sort of like we could say written order or law of God, sort of like almost Old Testament type language that she's referencing that she, by the way that she describes herself, apparently is the rightful recipient of the blood of sinners that those who are condemned are under her authority under her power which is just an interesting thing that kind of gets presented in the story that isn't necessarily out and outright alluded to or stated but is something that she says and aslan doesn't correct her it's that's true although he does rebuke her like caleb said for um, for repeating the the magic to him but yeah, so they talk in, about the uh, the old magic and the older magic still. That yes, Aslan right. Yeah, at about. the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that she's she's stating the law as it is understood to creation almost, but then Aslan is referring to the law that that pre exists creation, and so that's that's a really cool. And of course, that law has to do with the sacrifice and the love and the 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 salvation of Edmund through the giving of life willingly. Uh, as Aslan says, a willing victim who is killed in a traitor's stead. And when that happens, the stone table cracks and death itself turns backwards. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So uh, the stone table, um, I mean, it's supposed to represent the cross, but any significance to it being a stone in this story? Um, I've always taken it as, so the the stone table breaks as the veil is torn. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. that's the way I've always taken it. A hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's definitely a reference to the veil situation in the Gospels. I would say the significance of it being a table is indicative of the Old Testament picture of an altar. Oh, okay. yeah. Think yeah. back to the Old Testament, right? So how the Jews would sacrifice on the altar before the Lord, and that was the sort of the the equivalency for the lamb that we then see in in the upright position with Jesus on the cross. So I th- I think that Lewis was trying to tie together those images with the veil the altar the cross into one central sort of picture that would communicate hopefully communicate all of that yeah um we also and i, I can't remember the order i think this maybe before aslan is killed they they shave his mane very yes. similar to uh the beard being plucked from jesus yeah um, yeah I think he stabbed also like the spear stabbing in the in the Bible. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, just a lot of <laughs> a lot of very clear. If you don't think this is Jesus, he's making yeah. it very clear. <laughs> yeah, this is supposed to be Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, and I think it's even more clear in I think it's the third book, Boy to Don Treader, where he's like. Yeah, you know me as Aslan here. I'm known by a different name in your yes. world. Like, hit, yeah, hit, yeah, hit, yeah. hit. If your kids are still not following, you yep. know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, th- and that's why... That That's kind of why, as far as, like, the adaptations, I don't mind them ending with Voyage of the Dawn Treader is because, like, if you didn't know there was more, I'm known by another name, that's a pretty good cap off. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's why I don't necessarily. I, of course, I want them to go through all seven, all the way <laughs> to the last battle. But like, yeah, if you're gonna stop somewhere before then, yeah. Voyage of the Dawn Treader's not. Yeah, oh, I think oh. that the the company that Disney was working with lost the rights after 
Don Treader, so that's why they stopped. Um, yeah. I know mm-hmm. that there's a new production company, and Tripping Orc mentioned he thinks it might be Netflix that is going to be making a new Narnia series. I'm I'm very nervous <laughs> about this. Uh, the the writer, of, I think the Barbie movie is working on it's, it. It's, so. it's Greta Gerwig, which that that definitely is. Yeah. It's kind insane. of a red flag, as if you've seen how like Wheel of Time and other properties have been in Lord of the Rings have been treated like by Amazon and stuff. It's a it's a red flag here about uh, <laughs> are they going to do it justice or not? Um, and we'll and see. to be fair. I think everybody was concerned when Disney got the rights originally. True. Like True. After, yeah, yeah. yeah, after the BBC production, which again wasn't the most incredible quality in terms of the visuals and all that, but I think was really pretty spot on to staying true to the text. So there was some concern. Hopefully it would they'll still you know, I'm always sort of crossing my fingers saying, I mean, we have the books, like we know how the story goes. So hopefully it's not some just absolute abhorrent <laughs> horrible you know like I, I i don't know some like fast and furious yeah. type version of <laughs> where, where it's just yeah like a totally different story we'll, we'll see we'll know right away if like susan is the main character in this version we'll know that oh, okay hold up you don't understand yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that yeah that's that, that, that would really be it like right yeah i mean i i think and I, I do think it's interesting. Like you could say that there's a main, a different main character in every. Lucy's the main character of *Final Witch in the Wardrobe*. I think yeah. that we can kind of. Yeah, without yeah. without question. Yeah. No. So like you, you know Disney, you know who, uh, or it, it's not even Disney, but you know you know Netflix. Right now, companies love having their um, uh, female protagonists. Lucy's a perfect one. So. You know, go mm-hmm. go crazy with her, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so tripping orc benches, they'd have to introduce brand new characters. Um, well, I guess Silver Chair would still be uh, useless, but then you'd have to. What's her name? Jill Poles, the other character. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you start losing your main four kids and stuff. So I I get it. Why you're that would be a, especially if each movie is performing less and less as they go on, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. well, now we're taking even a bigger risk about to get rid of our whole cast. Yeah. Um, so I, I get it from a business standpoint, but yeah. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that Disney made. It was like, oh, it's a pretty good attempt at a movie, and then they didn't make any more. And you're like, uh, there's, there's more story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so let's continue with the story. Um, we have the resurrection. And mm-hmm. the witch is uh, which is defeated. There's a, a major battle that happens. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that battle actually takes place <clears throat> uh, before they know that Aslan is resurrected. Like, I'm, yes. I mean, I, I mean, it takes place after they know too. But like, it starts mm-hmm. before they know he's resurrected, um, which I right. always thought was really interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at that point, at at, at that point, uh, it, it it it's just a, a climax. I'm not gonna say that like Lewis, you know, stops having things to say after the resurrection, but like, is there much else to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say it's interesting because it kind of like jumps in time at that point where it's like okay, and then they grew up and they're adults, and we're gonna skip over all the stuff about them being rulers, and and now the story's over. They're back home, you know. It, it kind of right. like speeds up really fast after that point. Yeah. Let I, I before we move on to to, to Prince Caspian, I do want to talk about their titles because I, I oh, find sure. their titles their titles yeah. to be very interesting. You have. High King Peter the Magnificent, which yes. I think is is <laughs> just very much Peter. Uh, the one that has always, you know, not baffled me, but just kind of like Queen Susan the Gentle. That mm-hmm. one, um, there, there, there's nothing that I've se- that I saw Susan do that was more gentle than Lucy, which I always thought was interesting. Yeah, I think, and I'm trying to remember through all of them. I remember, I remember Peter's. I remember Edmund's. I remember uh, Lucy's and, and Susan's. Now that you've mentioned, I think 
as I'm thinking back through the book, since I, I and I think the if I'm remembering correctly, they did this correctly in the films. Aslan does the naming of the titles when they're crowned. Yes, that okay. That is a super important aspect, I think, because when you go through the titles, the the sort of key for me is Edmund's title, the Just, because Edmund is called the Just. Obviously, in the story. Edmund has not been acting justly until a certain point, right? He finally does. He joins the right team. The way that I read that is almost like it's a picture of what Aslan wants and desires for the children to be. Oh, like it's a yeah. pointing to like, I, I does it like with Peter, um, Peter starts off when he's attacked by Fenris's guard. He's afraid, like he's afraid of the wolves. <laughs> he's not quite sure right. if he can be, you know, Peter Wolf Spain, you know, but then he does. He, he, Aslan says, Hey, everybody back off, let him fight the wolf. He overcomes his fear and he becomes Peter the Magnificent. And so I, I think there's a sense where for Susan, her character is almost more feisty and fiery. And there's a desire in Aslan to see her sort of bring that, not, not bring it under control like it's wrong for her to be excited, but like that there's a, there's a rashness maybe to her spirit. That needs to be that that needs to be changed. Needs to be um, what's the word I'm thinking of? But there's a balance to each of the characters, right? Between the negative mm -hmm. and the positive of their their emotions and their personalities. And I I just I see that in the names in the titles that that's a, a picture of sort of like a final um, a crescendo to the characters themselves becoming who they were born to be, kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we'll move on to Prince Caspian. Yep. Uh, real, real quick before okay. we move on to Prince yep. Caspian, um, I, I do want to bring up this uh, this tweet that I've always held okay. on to uh, by Brennan Lee Mulligan, who is a part of College Humor and Dropout and does a lot of D and D stuff. Um, I've always thought this was really funny. In C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, crucifixion and resurrection are seen through the lens of allegory with Aslan as Christ juxtaposed against the backdrop of fawns and dryads, pagan imagery in service of a Christian theme. Mm. There are also two beavers named Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that, 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 I, that offers nothing except maybe it does because I think that I mean, it's for it's 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 for kids, uh, and so of course you're going to name Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, but still have all this allegory. I just wanted to bring up that tweet because I've always thought it was really funny. <laughs> that is funny, yeah. Um, so Prince Caspian. To be honest, I was not crazy about this book. It was it was just it felt like. Like almost we're we're doing Macbeth or something now, you know. It just it there was just kind of a tonal yeah. shift. I, um, I'm I'm very curious what you have to say, Daniel, because this is definitely one that I actually won't have too too much to say on. Um, I've struggled finding the faith allegory in this one myself. Well, with, I think uh, I think with there is. Yeah, yeah with Prince, Prince Caspian. Caspian. I think okay. when they are where Aslan's still there, but they don't see him. Like, like I think that happens to us on our Christian walk, where there are times where uh, God feels distant, but he's he's still there. You just don't know it. Like he's still kind of guiding their path. Sure, that, that's, sure. That's the part I got there. But yeah, yeah, Caspian. So, and I'm kind of drawing this from the book release order. Because, like, so Prince Caspian follows Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And as I'm looking at the way the titles kind of go through all the way to Silver Chair, and then, of course, we get Horson's Boy, Magician's Nephew toward the end for Last Battle, there seems to be, and kind of alluding back to what you you made the comment earlier, Caleb, when, when uh, Lewis finishes with the resurrection, you know, what more is there to say, right? <laughs> like, what else? Mm -hmm. What else yeah. is there? And I really feel like, if we're looking at Narnia as like a, as a closed story of creation to, you know, final new creation, like book of revelation, like Genesis revelation kind of thing. It seems to be that Prince Caspian is the first sort of like old Testament nod. Okay. Even though it happens after the story. Cause like when you get into the story, there's like the major themes you have uh, a denial of the, the ancient story, the meta narrative by 
uh, Miraz and by his people like, oh, those wives tales about fawns. And that's not true, even though they're lying. Right. They're deceiving <laughs> Prince Caspian <laughs> because there's a dwarf who lives in the castle who's teaching him the truth about what really did happen. But they are for their you know political expedient reasons. They're trying to keep that all, you know, quiet. But there's a denial of the meta narrative. So like, you know, the time when after, you know, Moses and the prophets died and now people are saying, well, did that really happen? Was that true? And then as you move forward in the story, when Aslan brings the Pevensies back, there's the there's sort of this major arc where everyone's faith is being tested. And you have I forget what his name is. One of the dwarves who's evil says, well, we need to reconjure the spirit of the white witch like we need to go back to sorcery. And so there's this picture almost like in the Old Testament between like prophets of Baal versus Elijah, this idea of like, hey, let's try Let's let's go make a covenant with the devil and see if that works, because apparently the Lord, apparently, you know, God isn't answering our prayers. So that like all through Caspian, that's kind of seems to be the theme is this wrestling of trust in God based on what's already happened. Right. The testimony, the big for, for in, in the Old Testament, the big event would be like the Exodus. Right. In comparison to like the New Testament with the resurrection. And so there's like this this hallmark of God's people who know the truth and yet have chosen to uh, not believe or stop believing. Peter's caught up in that. He's like almost brought into like bringing the witch back because he's like, yeah, well, we are. We're pinned down here. And, you know, uh, the I forget not the Talmarins, but the um, uh, Miraz's people. Um, That's the Talmarins. It's the Talmud. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. You're thinking of like, like, the, yeah. the Calermines or whatever. Yeah, the Calermines and the Talmud. Yeah. So the Talmud like, yeah, they've got us pinned down here. Like, there's no escape. We're going to starve to death. We've got to get out of here. And then they get this offer like, yeah, hey, let's make a covenant with the witch. Let's bring her spirit back. And even though we went through this whole amazing saga of her being destroyed and, you know, a <laughs> hundred years of winter and never Christmas and Aslan had to die and rise again. Yeah, all that happened. But hey, let's go back where we started. So there seems it's, it's kind of like this, this very much Old Testament narrative of, you know, choose you this day who you will serve, like Joshua says, mm -hmm. or like in the case of Elijah on Mount Carmel, if Baal is God, serve him. But if the Lord is God, serve him and worship him only. And that comes through in the end because Aslan does come back. He does manifest. He wakes up the dryads and the river gods. He, wake, he wakes up all of Narnia. The trees come back to life. And there's this rejuvenation of the supernatural aspect of the story by the faith that is held out onto by a handful of people like Lucy's one of them, but even she struggles, everybody it, it's a, it's a testing of faith kind of story. I really kind of, I, I, I think James maybe would be the best book to equate that to, right? James talking about the testing of your faith, producing patience, or it might've been Paul, but that, that sort of idea that you see lived out in the old Testament period where Israel is being challenged and, and questioning the story of their faith. Like, yeah, we heard about how God like did all these amazing things and brought us out of Egypt, but like, is he still there? Is he still with us? Is he still listening to us? Things have changed geopolitically. There's new people in power. What are we to make of that? There's sort of all that kind of going on as Lewis is building the framework of his world, almost working backward to creation, which he eventually gets to with the, the uh, magician's nephew and then finally looking forward with the last battle. This is why I love talking to Daniel. He will pull all this stuff out of a story that I will totally miss. And my my big oh, yes. takeaway from this book was Prince Caspian got bit by a werewolf. Why did he turn into a werewolf? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, <laughs> no, it's it's so interesting because you're you're so right. It's so obvious, and I don't know what I I read this when I was like nine or ten and i've read this you know yeah. many times uh after that and i'm like yeah. why didn't i catch any of this of course sure. i mean and, and and it's even more obvious with how it ends with uh them crossing the bridge yeah kind of like exodus with the red sea like yeah. it's yeah. so obvious and I, I just never caught that no that's May, you know what? Maybe it is because it takes place after the resurrection, and that's what confused me. That, oh, that might... 100 percent. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I think that's part of why people do get sort of like because it's not it's not happening linearly in in the way that we know the narrative. Because we are, we're thinking New Testament believers, we're like, okay, this the resurrection is way after all that stuff. And Lewis is almost like 
I think in his mind, like, oh, wait, I got to go back and tell the foundation, like, why this is all happening. But I'm already here. So I guess I'll just make that. Yeah. <laughs> <after that. laughs> and so it creates this like and, and I and Lewis talked about it. it's not a one to one equivalency. Exactly. It is in the theme of scripture. But like I, I'm trying to remember who there's a there's a little book. I forget the name of the author. Let me see if I can look this up real quick. It's called A to Z through Narnia or something like that. And in the story, let's see here. Lewis uh, Marcos? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. And in the story, when it's it starts with Aslan, A for Aslan, and he talks about how when Lewis was interviewed, he makes the point that for Lewis, it wasn't, it, it is an allegory, but for Lewis, it was more than that. He was like, I'm not simply writing an allegory of Jesus and the cross in Narnian terms. Lewis said, I'm creating a story that would, that would give us a picture of what it would look like for Jesus to go to a different world in a different context and be a savior there the way that he was here. So it's, it's like, it's even more so it's not just that, 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 um, Aslan is a form of Jesus it's that he is Jesus in Narnia. I mean, that he is, like, with, in, with, yeah. with the ending of Don Shredder, I mean, like that makes sense to like take it yeah. very literally. I am known yeah. by a different name. Yeah. Right. And we, we're kind of jumping ahead. We, we get the imagery of him as a lamb turning into the lion. Um, yeah, just mm -hmm. very clearly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, if in you're case not, you if don't you're not, get it yet. Yeah. If you haven't <laughs> yeah, caught yeah, on yet, I, hint, 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 hint. <laughs> Four <laughs> books in, you still don't get it. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I, I did hate Prince Caspi, and I just it just did hit me like the other <laughs> the other books did, you know. Yeah, uh, it it definitely is. I I'm really interested for you to watch the movie because the okay. movie adds a lot because there's not enough here in this book to make a movie, so they had to add a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I already told you about like the big thing they added, which was an entire infiltration action scene where they are going to assassinate Miraz. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, yeah, yeah. Try to try to explain the the faith imagery in that. I don't. Know. <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was odd. It it kind of it it almost made sense in in the sense of like okay, well. Like the Narnians are, they're not really kind of following along or being led by Aslan directly. So I can see where they would think, okay, we need to take the offensive and sure, attack yeah. our enemy. This it, it almost, almost kind of like a nod to like this land is ours kind of thing, like kind of like an, like an Israel Canaanite kind of thing. But oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I will say for me, the thing that I really kind of was frustrated with was the impromptu for me, impromptu. Uh, Caspian Susan love story. Well, they had to give her something to do. I I, I get yeah sure I will take that. I, yeah. Just, oh it was oh like, yeah. By the way, uh, yeah. There's a in the movie. There's a Caspian <laughs> Susan love story. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. Oh man. I'm sorry. Spoiler it's all right. Up. It's fine. It's no. fine. Yeah, uh, I haven't no, seen the no, movies no. so. Um, yeah. Which which is which is so funny because it goes nowhere. Um, yeah and, yeah like. <laughs> I mean, like, and, and here's the thing, it has to go nowhere because of who Rillian's mom is. Right, right. Well, and, and, you, and you wouldn't be yeah. able to change it because it is it is important who Rillian's mom is. Correct. We'll see. And, and yeah, so again, trying not to spoil anything. The rest of the books make it clear that Susan can't be the person that ends up with Caspian. I'll just say it that way. Yeah. Like Caleb saying, like it's lineages and all of that stuff. And it would... If it went somewhere, it would mess literally the entire story up. Mm -hmm. you, they'd yeah. have they'd have to rewrite it, the the story. But yeah, it was that was just a weird anyway. Yeah, give her something to do, which I don't know. I, I think I felt like if you're looking at the books from a conversation dialogue, I think Susan contributes. I I would say just as much as she does in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Maybe not as not as not as much. 
it's but, her susan's horn is what draws them to yeah. caspian correct yeah so yeah absolutely. yeah so which i i would think in the movie that's where it starts is like hey here's your horn back and like oh man of course they're gonna be together <laughs> he gave right. her horn back <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> Um, so I think that's pretty much what you have to say about Prince Caspian, other than Aslan telling the two older children, uh, you're not coming back. This is your final <laughs> Narnia adventure. Yeah. That was at the time reading really a bummer. I was like, oh man, sad day. <laughs> well, yeah for, yeah, for me, it was like, oh man, they're getting rid of Peter. Like, yeah, I'm left, I'm left with this Edmund guy now because I didn't get it. <laughs> I didn't get it. What are human later. looks you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 now Edmund and Lucy are like, oh yeah, they're, they are my children. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which uh, Tripping Orc says was his favorite of uh, the series. <clears throat> I, I, awesome. I think I agree so far. Yeah, I, I think this was the one I enjoyed the most. Um, we we get introduced to uh, is he their cousin? Uh, Eustace is their cousin, yes. I believe. Um, and he's just kind of he mocks them, he doesn't believe anything they're talking about Narnia. He just he's just kind of a bratty kid. He's if, kind of if awful. I may, I am going to read the first line, which I think is a brilliant first line. Okay. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. Yep, there it is. <laughs> such a great opening. It's, it's such a great opening. You can in that. Oh, I'm sorry. I just Caleb read my mind on this because this I wanted to mention this because it was so impactful when I read the first <laughs> the You can hear Lewis is like, yeah, this this kid is a problem, but I feel so bad for him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like the ugly duckling in my language. Who could love this kid? And and, so, and yeah, go ahead. In the movie, they could have not. They could not have gotten a more perfect person. Oh uh, with, yeah, with Will Poulter. And oh, and so. now that we now that we've seen him as Adam Warlock and we know what he is now, I'm like, oh man, imagine if we got the last battle. Yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> it would be. I I would have loved it. Now here yeah. here's the thing though. I will say as like as a pop culture question, and I don't recall the name of the guy from the BBC, but I really liked that casting for Silver Chair, and I. I don't know. It was it was tough because I did like the new guy, but between the two of them, I don't know. I feel like maybe the BBC kid did it better. Okay, because I I, I, yeah. I'm, I think I'm gonna watch them uh, probably before the the next uh, Narnia discussion because I definitely want to. I've never seen any of them. Oh, you uh, haven't seen the BBC series? No. Oh man, yeah, I would definitely go back and, and rewatch it again graphics and you know all it, it's it's bad it's like early sure, yeah or, or before yeah but but as far as like dialogue and character and all that i really i liked them i thought they did a really good job and and uh, it's a for houston it's like the, the 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 guy who plays him just captures that like really like weaselly like like on the on the one side coming into voyage of the montreal like this kid is terrible but then the transformation and and him like realizing, yeah, I was really a bad kid. I need to like get my act together and do the right thing, and you know, be yeah. be with Aslan. I just I thought it was really well done. Yeah. So yeah, his I, name is uh, David Thwaites. Is the actor? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I I have always wanted um, more of uh, the the Eustace Edmund relationship because I yeah. I always thought that like. Cause like like there, there's enough of it in Don Treader, but I, I want more of it because it's like it, it it's almost like um, the idea of you know as, as believers you know we've we've got our peers, but then you know we're always gonna have our peers, and we're always gonna have people who are let's say more experienced in faith than us question like 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 right. mentors and then right. we're always going to have those less that we can mentor yes um and so i've always felt that that like eustace was or at least could have like been more overtly the the mentee of edmund yeah <laughs> yeah because edmund's like 
oh man is this what i was like <laughs> yeah yeah right exactly you can you can 100 percent see that i i see that i see there's almost a tension in 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 don treader with edmund being like i don't want to be peter but i'm peter in this situation right right and, and so there's this like being on the other side of the coin because like in in wardrobe you know, when they fight with each other and he's like, oh, you know, you think you're dad, you know, and you, you can't tell me what to do. But then now, you know, Peter coming of age, obviously being through his experience with Aslan being forgiven and now seeing Eustace embody sort of that spirit he had initially when they first come to the professor's house. To me, it was it was pure genius on Lewis's part to really show that in a relationship with like, yeah, this isn't just an Edmund thing. This is a this is a a human condition thing. This is something all of us go through and it's maybe more painful, not just coming through it, but then seeing that in others, seeing that issue that needs to be worked out. And uh, yeah, I just, I loved that dynamic hundred percent. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I say we don't get enough of Edmund and Eustace, but uh, of course the, the true mentor mentee relationship is Reaper Chief and Eustace. <laughs> Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, which, I, I, I mean, at this point, I, th I think I've already said my, my piece on Reaper Chief, uh, like just very much he, I mean, he, he is the, I almost said the blind servant. That's not what I mean, the faithful servant. That's, I think yeah. that's, that, that's the best way to put it. Um, so. He remind me of a, uh... This is gonna sound weird. A uh, uh, wharf from Star Trek: Next Generation, like he's he's following the the tra the teachings of the Klingon, and he's just warrior, and he's just gonna follow through and do what you know what the uh, yeah. his teachings are. You know. Um. So this one, they are looking for. I think it's the Lost Lords of Narnia. I think there's like nine of them or something. Like I, it's been a while. Um, so yeah. Th this this book is weird because yeah. this <laughs> out of out of all of the books, this one is almost like this is almost an anthology book, like a um, oh, yeah. like a like a like a like a book of short stories, because uh, there's not necessarily one thing that they're after. Um, each island that they stop at kind of has its own story. Which I find very interesting. Um, which they change in the movie, but you know, you're not really it's, gonna have vignettes in a kid's movie. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. It's it's seven lords. Seven seven seven, seven lords. Okay. Oh, there it is. Seven. Sure. Hey. There's there's your yeah, there's your biblical yeah. seven. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Number of completion. Yeah. So um, and no, he's a hundred percent right though. It it is a I would say that it is an anthology. I, I think that it's I think the weirdness of the story is that it seems to serve it. It's a, there are lessons learned. There's character development, just like the other books, but it seems to function almost. And, and I'm not saying this to, to dog it or, or bring it down, but it seems to me very similar to how a horse and his boy is kind of like a, a thread connecting the other stories together. Because there's things, there are things that take place in, again, not to give spoilers or there's stuff that takes place in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader that connects to not just the Silver Chair, but to Last Battle and sort of this just like, again, this, this theme connector where so you have a bunch of different sort of like almost like, um, like mini stories mm -hmm. within that are all sort of tied together and I guess kind of like in a video game, it's kind of like we've already beaten the boss level, we've already gone through the game, now we're just doing side missions. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it really, it really <laughs> feels like like that. And and I granted, I love the side missions. I love what happens. Wait, but you that's, know what it, that's how I would how I would relate it. You putting it that way, I now know why this is his favorite of the three that he's read so far. <laughs> this is this is the Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Yeah, well, I was going to say, uh, well, yeah, maybe Wind Waker. I was going to say Majora's Mask where you get caught up helping everybody. But yeah, those are two games I love. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so, uh, yeah, yeah. And like, that that's the thing. I think more than anything, because there there is definitely a, um, uh, there's a difference between a, a, an epic and a tale. 
Um, yeah. You know, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I can, you can be seen as an epic. Mm-hmm. Voyage of the Dawn Treader, very much a tale. Yeah. Um, kind of like how Ocarina of Time is an epic, while Majora's Mask is a tale. Just kind of like mm-hmm. uh, in that sense. But yeah, no, no. Putting it like that, it completely makes sense that Voyage uh, was your favorite of the three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, I think the first island deals with uh, slavery. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So we deal with that. And then the second, I think the second island is where Eustace uh, turns into the dragon. Mm-hmm. Which is my favorite. I yeah. Um, oh man, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I, I have the book in front of me. I'm trying to find the uh, the, the the actual. It, it, it's almost like just like a great monologue you would want to use as like an audition, um, where he talks <laughs> about like. I think he calls it the good pain, where like 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 it hurt, but I knew I couldn't do it myself. Yeah, yeah. When Aslan's freeing him, yeah. Oh my goodness, I love it. Yeah, yeah. That, I, yeah. That, I go, go ahead. Say that that reminds me of when you were trying to battle sin, and you you keep trying and keep trying, and you just cannot get a victory. And then when yeah. God steps in, and I think that's kind of what we're seeing here of him trying to to shed that skin. Um, yeah, that the way that they depicted that in the film. The, the Disney adaptation was really, I thought was perfect where again, spoilers, but I just, I got to describe it because it was so good. Eustace is, he's in his dragon form. He's on the beach and he's just miserable, right? Understand so that the ring is digging into his arm or the, the bracelet, however you want to describe mm-hmm. it. And Aslan appears, Eustace is afraid obviously. And he starts to paw at the sand with his claws and as he's pawing into the sand, the flesh starts to rip and tear with claw marks. And Aslan, like, he's like growling, but he's not growling at him. He's like, he's trying to remove this, this terrible curse, this pain. And, and it's, it's something he has to physically do that is causing pain to Eustace, but it's not to hurt him. It's to free him. And I just, oh man, it, to me, it's such a perfect picture of God's relationship and like the reason that we're because like I forget I think it's the same island where the whole the, the gold that the, they or they find the pool rather everything's about the the Lord has been turned to gold and Edmund and Caspian start to fight over like they become bewitched by the by the gold and the, the lust for for the money and the, the potential for just like turning things into gold and making tons of money. And so they start to fight each other and then they are broken from that. I forget if it's Lucy or I think it's Lucy that like gets them to stop fighting. Yep. But there's this idea of like in stopping the sin before it happens. And obviously for Houston, that doesn't, he puts on the, the bracelet and he turns into the dragon. And so there's almost this picture full circle with Aslan. Like he's, he's, Aslan is angry in the sense that he's pain that he has to put Eustace through pain to free him when it would have been better for him to have never had to go through that. Mm -hmm. But there's a redemptive quality, obviously like he redeems him through it, but it's, it's that kind of a thing. Like it would have been better to not have to do this, but I have to do it now. And it's the only way for you to be free. And so we're going to do this. And so it's just, to me, it's a very vivid picture of struggles with issues of, of, of being, uh, tempted by sin, the effects of sin, and the real challenge and necessity of having to go through the pain of that to be able to overcome and get through it. So, yeah. When I got these books from the library, um, <laughs> the cover to this one was just a dragon crying and a mouse standing next to him. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. Oh, man, that's better. Mine is, uh, I'll, here, I'll go ahead and, oh, my lights are on. Hold on one second. But but yeah, um yeah, I think the third island is the one where things are the pool turns oh, things into gold. Yeah, as you're um, saying, that's, I think I think you're you're 100 right. If you've got your notes, obviously you're you've got that right. I yeah, yeah that, that one there, and then the picture that we have in the foreground is the one that I had for my book with uh, Pete with Edmund and Lucy and then Eustace being grabbed by his trousers. Right. <laughs> 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 if 
very terrified and not sure what's going on. Uh, yeah, this is when great. I, I yeah. think this is where they're being pulled into the painting, right? Yes, that's right. Yep. And and they 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 the room their room fills with water from the painting, and then they end up swimming to the surface, and they're in Narnia, and the Dawn Treader's just off from them, and they get pulled in. Yeah, just a, a great opening to the story. But yeah, that that artist rendering that image we've got there is what I had from my book. And I yeah. bought the I bought the series originally as individuals, and then I got I've got a really big I got it over here somewhere. Hold on. Um, oh, is it the is it the big Bible of one? Yeah, yeah I have that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I have that too. I I have that, and I have the uh, the seven book collection. So yeah, 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 yeah. The individuals. That's how I first first read through it was with the individual books, and then I was gifted that one. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I can see why Aaron would find that an odd <laughs> picture. <laughs> you almost feel like, well, with a picture like it should be called the crying dragon and the weird mouse with the sword. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a uh, there's a comic book series that had to be inspired by Chron Chronicles of Narnia called Mouse Guard, where there's all these mice with swords running around fighting each other and stuff. But you know, yeah. that's what I'm thinking of when I see that image. Yeah. I, it one, makes me one, think. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, how how much of Reaper Cheap was in uh, Prince Caspian? Because um, I feel like he was just more prominent in the the movie Prince Caspian than he was in the books. Because you know uh, he's he's there, but he's, it's not nowhere near as much as Voyage of the Dawn Treader. He's much more yeah. of a character. In yeah, this one. I, it's something I never thought of until you said, "Oh, there's just this uh, this dragon and this mouse with a sword." <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely an odd book cover i'm just like what <laughs> but it, it got me intrigued like you know what is happening in this book so um uh so yeah so we let's see what's after the island with the pool is this this next the dream island i believe so let me see you've got i can Lone Islands Adventures in Houston. Is it the? I think it's the Dream Island and then the Dark Island. Yeah, where the they meet. I think one of the lords. He's like, turn back. You do not want to be here because all your dreams are going to become reality. And um, at first, they're excited, and then they're like, oh wait. We all have nightmares. Why are we going to this <laughs> <laughs> to this island? Um, so yeah, I think I think that I thought I thought that island was pretty cool. The old man though, that was uh, Ramandu, right? Or my am I, am I, or am I jumping ahead? Uh, the island, the dreams come true. Lord Roop is his name. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think Ramadu's Island actually lasts now that I think about it. Yeah, Ramadu's the fallen star, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is this the book? Because I'm getting this one, a silver chair mixed up. It, it must be this book where they encounter the the creatures that are invisible. I think they're ugly or something. And they have to break the magician spell. Like Lucy has yes. to look at the magician's book. Yes. And she gets mm -hmm. tempted by the book and she's like um, she's eavesdropping on some of her schoolmates about what they really think about her and stuff. And uh, I think uh, Aslan like chastises her about it. Like, you know, you, you should have done that. Um, I, might, I might be misremembering all this, but I, th I think this is that, that book where that happens. Uh, it looks like that we're having some troubles with uh, with Daniel. Oh, uh, are you back, Daniel? Uh, I think we've lost Daniel. Uh oh. Okay, so while he's working on that, um, does that sound right, though, Caleb? What I what I was yep. saying. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I'm just like, am I making this up? Because <laughs> it got dead silent. <laughs> No, 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 no. You, you, you are, you are correct. Um, so the Dream Island and the Dark Island are are the same. That that's what I was getting confused about because uh, I was like, I thought the Dark Island was 
was last, but the Dream Island and the Dark Island are the same island with uh, Lord Rupert. And then uh, Ramadu's Island is the last island. Okay. Let me try removing him and adding him back. Um, sure. Yeah. While we try to fix that. Yeah, because um, I, I, I definitely want to... I definitely don't want to move on to the ending until we can get him. <laughs> yeah. Any luck, Daniel? Can you hear us? No. Um, weird. So, Daniel, if you can hear me, you might try to re-click the link, uh, exit out, and start over. Uh, let's see. I think he's texting me. Please pause while we're having technical difficulties again. Um, so... Uh, Orc said something uh, a little bit ago that uh, I didn't know, uh, which is that Warwick Davis played Reaper Cheap in the BBC series. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I would I would assume that then he was just wearing a costume, Maybe, or, was it, yeah. or was it a puppet? I, I don't know. Well, you know what's funny. So, do you know who plays him in the movies? I do not. Simon Pegg. Yeah, I could I could see that. The uh the audio version that I heard was uh had a very high pitched voice for Reaper Cheap. So uh Daniel, can you hear us? I can, I'm back. <laughs> oh whoa, okay. whoa. You were a little crackly, so let's see. Um could you hear us while we were talking just then? No, you cut out. Probably about like I don't know two or three minutes ago. Okay. Oh, um, so your your microphone is super crackly. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it's not plugged in or the settings are wrong. Um, let me see. I'm looking up a picture of uh, of Warwick Davis right now because I'm really curious as to what it looks like. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, it's, you got to remember it's a BBC production, so it's. No, no, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Let me pull this up. Uh... Am I always still having problems with my mic? Yeah, it's still real crackly. You might try the link one more time or try okay. unplugging the microphone and plugging it back in. Okay. Give me one second. I'm gonna come okay. Out. So let's take right. a look at this. Look at him. Oh, he's like a Chuck E. Cheese character or something. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Is it, is it is that the Five Nights at Freddy movie? <laughs> you know, you know what it reminds me of. Uh, you are, I doubt you remember this, Caleb, because this was uh, probably before your time. How about now, Daniel? Testing one, two, three. Much Yay. better. Uh -oh. Okay. Praise God. Awesome. Okay. okay. Uh, Ooh, what yeah. Were you oh, uh, no, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So this reminds me of a show that was on when I was a kid. Um, Zoobly Zoo. I don't, I, I'm sure that's way before your time. Does not there. ring a bell at all. Uh, I will pull up a picture, but he <laughs> he would fit. He would fit right in with the. Uh, um, whoops, wrong button. Um, so yeah, while I'm pulling that up, we were talking about uh, there was the Ooh, island with the, the dark invisible island. creatures. Um, yeah, this show. <laughs> Zoobly Zoo. I watched oh, it when I was wow. a kid. Yeah, yeah. Nah. Reaper Cheap. Mark Davis would fit right in there as Reaper Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but there was an island where there were invisible creatures and they all said they were ugly and uh, they had to get Lucy to go upstairs to get, find the magician's book and she was, um, yeah, she the was being... 
Yeah, she was getting tempted by the spells in the book. I thought that whole section was very interesting. Um, and, and she would I forget think it was the interesting stuff that she... because I don't, I don't think we've seen Lucy be tempted by anything yet. Um, yeah, in 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 this uh, in this series, she's always kind of been like this golden child. So it, it, it's interesting to see her. Um, not kind of fall, but like everyone stumbles. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, she talks about, if I recall, again, I might be getting this mixed up, that she she was reading this amazing story and then she would forget the story as soon as she finished reading it. And it's kind of like you're, it's almost like she was seeing like Revelations, the book of Revelations, just like, here's the future, but you're not ready for this shit. We're not, <laughs> you're, you're, you're reading ahead. Right. You know. Um, she got an early copy of the last battle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, and then she gets uh, she uses some spell to eavesdrop on some classmates, and then um, Aslan like chastises her uh, for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought all this was was very interesting. And then, um, and then, what did you say the creatures were called again? Uh, monopods. I'm trying to remember what the actual. Um, hold on one sec here. Uh, the duffel pods, duffel pods. So it's, yeah, like a, Duff, Duffer's Island. That's what it's called. Yeah, and so so they're like a it's like a dwarf type creature, but they only have one foot, and it's a big foot. It's a it's very the the protuberance is very large, so they can like hop and jump like bunnies or or rabbits or something. And so they make this big this really loud pounding or booming sound when they hit the ground, and so they the children or Lucy rather, Lucy, and I forget whoever's with her, hear this this sort of thump sound everywhere around them whenever the duffel pods show up, but they don't know, they, they can't see them because they've been made invisible through the, the wizard's curse or spell. And so they just hear this just plump, plump, plump all around. And then the voices, they can hear them speaking. But uh, yeah, that was, that's, uh, again, side missions, just really, really yeah. Yeah. wild little things going on. <laughs> In the backdrop yeah. of Narnia's story, yeah. Um, so this part I don't remember too well. The Ramad, uh, Ramadu Island with uh, the one that's the fallen star. I think there's like three mm -hmm. lords that are asleep, yes. And and so to wake them, they're going to, have to continue on to the land of, of Aslan, and someone's going to have to remain there, yes. Uh, um and during this journey, we see the the Mer people, and and then uh, the land of Aslan. So, is I was taking the land of Aslan to represent uh, uh, heaven, mm -hmm. and this was reminding me of uh, the story where I might be getting this mixed up, uh, where uh, Elijah, who who was it that's carried up to heaven in the uh, chariot? Um, Elijah. Elijah. Okay, Elijah I didn't have it right. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's what the Reaper Cheap part reminded yeah, me of. Elijah sees him. Elijah, yes. his, his Padawan learner, his Jedi in training, watches him leave yeah. the planet in the chariot of fire. So, yeah, yeah, so that's what this reminded me of uh, when yeah, Reaper Cheap yeah. uh, continues on here. Uh, speaking of uh, Ramandu, uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a spoiler. Do they bring up who Rillian's mother is in Silver Chair? If they uh, did, I don't remember. Um, they may have, I may have just missed it when I was listening to it. They, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, well, I'll, yeah, I mean, if it's a spoiler, it's a spoiler. Um, but <laughs> do you remember that on Ramandu's Island, he actually lives with his daughter? Who does? Ramandu lives with his daughter on the Oh, island. oh, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Casp Caspian marries her, and that's really. Oh important. yeah, 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 yeah. That that is yes. That is in the silver chair. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's, that's the, that's it's, the spoiler I was trying to when we were talking about Susan the 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 brief love affair that never goes mm -hmm. anywhere. Why that doesn't work is because you have this part of voyage where it's he marries Ramondo's daughter, yeah. and if Susan had ended up with him, then that would change who Rillian's mom was. So yeah. Anyway, whole yeah. yeah anyway. Yeah. So. Um, and then I believe this is the lion and the lamb scene where uh, 
Aslan appears to them as a lamb and then turns into the lion. Yeah. If I'm remembering right. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say that's before they get to Aslan's country. Uh, when they're on, there's like a little, um, like a little spit of land that they sort of land on. Or uh, in fact, I don't even remember if there's actually a spit. I know there's one in the in the film's rendering. I'm trying to remember if there's one in the book, because prior to Aslan's country, there's this long uh, sort of stretch of the ocean where it's just like lilies, like lily pad kind of stuff growing up out of the out of the water. And mm-hmm. they're they're and the water's really sweet. It's really good to taste. Yeah, sometimes. and they yeah. they get younger when they drink the water. Yeah, they get stronger. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's invigorating, almost like a um, fountain of youth. Part of the yeah, ocean as you get close yeah. to heaven. And so they yeah, get through I, I there. Believe that ahead. that I believe that is after Ramadu's Island. I think it's like yeah. right before they get to um, uh, Aslan's country or the entrance to Aslan's country. Yeah. Right. And so, so it's so in, in any case, they they get to a point, whether they're whether they're on a small island or not. And I want to say that's where that transformation happens. So let's see here. And again, you know, functioning as the. Yeah, because Lucy talks to it. Um, she she says she asks the lamb, "Is this the way to Aslan's country?" And that's when the the, mm-hmm. the lamb transforms, right? And we get the the Revelation seven imagery of the lamb and the lion, and, and all or Revelation five lamb and lion stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and uh, I think we're getting close to the part where Aslan once again informs the children. This is your this is your last jaunt in Narnia, uh, Lucy yeah. and Edmund, and uh, they're not too happy about it. But, but <laughs> that's I am known by another name. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Which th- think about this because we actually we don't hear the conversation between Aslan, Peter, and Susan. Yeah, I would assume that he said the same thing there too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, this is just a, uh, you know, Tripping Orc said it, uh, I, this book does have a, a great ending. Um, oh this, yeah. Awesome. Ending. It, and side it, missions it, are fun. I love yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. Purely uh, literary just d- distinguishing is all, but yeah, no, I, I love it. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the, one of the reasons I love uh, Voyage of the Dawn Trader. There's the 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 Houston story in particular. Uh, to me, is is in my mind obviously reminiscent of the story that we find in the Book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, because he in the story I think it's chapter four of Daniel where he transforms into this this beast or this creature, whatever it is, yeah, yeah. nails and hair like a bird, whatever it is, this like lichen thing, and and it's through that process that Nebuchadnezzar then repents and and he's then granted his humanity back he transforms back into a man and so like that that's one of those like weird stories in the bible like usually don't get talked about or <laughs> preached or referenced <laughs> in church that to me is like heavily endemic of what's going on in Eustace's story because it's through that transformation that he doesn't he doesn't just get his humanity back but he's a different person he his character has been changed and he becomes a good guy. And so uh, he becomes a protagonist, a hero. So, yeah, I just wanted to make that reference before we got off Don Treader because, yeah. Hooray for side missions. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me ask you all this. Um, I, I have been very vocal about who my personal favorite character is, and I've also been very vocal about <clears throat> what my favorite book is that being Lion, the witch in the wardrobe i love edmund um and daniel because you've read past this you can go ahead and move past you know and you know of the seven what's your favorite but of course for my uncle uh of of the ones that you've read so far right so favorite book and favorite character okay this is probably gonna be controversial Okay. And also difficult. Um, 
the character one's the hard one because I, I man i love so many characters in the narnia saga i i love aslan that's an obvious one everybody mm. likes aslan the pevensey kids are great but i think probably my favorite just the character I just he's so different and i just love him for uh, there's all kinds of reasons is puddle glum okay okay i really like puddle glum is my guy <laughs> i love, I love yeah i love that <laughs> oh, yeah so much and um he was he was a when i first read silver chair that was one of the things that like kept me in the book <laughs> it was like i wanted to know what puddle glum thought of whatever was going on <laughs> and uh his perspective it's it's oh my goodness it's so it's so perfect and so um, yeah they're, they're 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 making like a live action zelda and you know how like link always has like this sidekick character whether it's navi or fee or you yeah, know someone yeah. to put something like like puddle gum kind of uh gives off that that vibe of just like keeping you on track hey here's where yeah. the quest is at yeah absolutely uh, yeah. Keep it on track he's he is it's it's so cool because he's like he's the adult character despite the fact that kids think that they're being adults, right? And they think they're right. being practical and sensible. It's really Puddleglum's being sensible. But he's so honest about, you know, just like, and, and again, it, it comes off as like depressing the way that the kids <laughs> receive it. He's like, oh, he's like, well, we'll try a fire, but it's probably going to get put out. The rain's going to come down and the food's not going to be that good. I just, I don't know, his disposition. I just love his approach. And yet, in spite of him having what to everybody else is a very glum pun intended uh look on life he is still uh staying true to the course and he's resilient in his faith that's what's crazy like you get to the very end and he he becomes this like philosopher right where he's debating with the witch with the the late the queen the green lady and he's saying even if it's it's almost like for me reading it it was almost like lewis used puddle glum to voice his perspective as like as an oxford don because in the story, he's making he's making a feel a a, a um, it's a philosophical argument for for the case for God, and for the case for belief and faith, and in in spite of what's going on in the world and claims that other people are making, so, sort of a naturalistic claim. Because that's what the Green Lady she's making this natural claim, like oh we can't see the sun and the sky and Narn. That's all that's all made up. That's in your head. You've imagined all this. And then for Puddleglum, he says, you know. It may be that our world is imaginary and yours is the real one, but I would rather believe in that world because our world can lick your world hollow. Like I, man, dude, I mm -hmm. love that scene. It's oh, so, yeah. I just, yeah. And uh, so, yeah. And then as far as, so that's, that's probably fa favorite character. And then I think, I think the fav my favorite book, just because it's so different and so off the beaten path from the other narratives around the Pevin season and, and Caspian is the horse and his boy. Okay. I really love the horse and his boy. I, it was so, when I read that story, it was so, um, it captivated me because it was so different. There was nothing in it that I was expecting or anticipating. So it just, it was very refreshing. I think from what I had come to expect from Narnia, which I loved, I love, I love the, the Narnia saga with the other books. But Horse and His Boy was really just fresh and different. And I liked it. So Okay. Yeah. Um, for me, this might be recency bias because I just read these. Either it's either Don Treader or uh Silver Chair. Okay. Was the favorite. Um it had to be one of those four, yeah, if that's all you read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and then my favorite character, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a cheap answer is, is Aslan. I'm just there's times in these books where I get bored. I'm just like, okay, where's when's Aslan going to show up? I'm just yeah, waiting yeah. for him to show up and do something. <laughs> right. Um. So I mean, for right now, that's my answer. It might change once I finish all the books. Um. But yeah, I think that's my answer right now. So okay. okay. Cool, so cool. is there anything else you want to talk about while we're wrapping up? Uh, I think we've hit the first three books pretty pretty good um yeah our our next show about narnia will be january 7th so they'll give me a nice month to <laughs> finish reading these to finish reading the show yeah yeah <laughs> there we go. um so yeah um i've really enjoyed this discussion daniel you're welcome anytime um <laughs> nice, nice. uh yeah um let's see what else i was gonna say there um 
yeah, technical difficulties aside, I, I think this has been a really fun conversation. I hope the audience oh, yeah, has enjoyed it. Absolutely, so. yeah, I enjoyed it.